This week on the Green Left News Podcast, Fatima Payman resigns Labor over its support for Israel's genocide. The University of Sydney introduces new draconian rules to clamp down on protests. And election results in France and Britain both change the status quo of politics in their respective countries. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. Uh, my name's Isaac Nellis and I'm talking to you from Gadigal Country in Sydney. And my name's Riley Breen and I'm joining you from uh, Wadjukunumna land in Bulupa. And we acknowledge that this land was never ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Green Left uh, pledges to support First Nations struggles across this continent and around the world. And we've got some uh, really interesting topics to discuss this week. Um, So kicking it off with what's been one of the biggest headlines uh, even in the mainstream media lately, which was Fatima Payman, who's a senator, resigning from Labor uh, on July 4th over its support for Israel's genocide. Um, So Payman had uh, voted for a Greens motion to recognize the state of Palestine, which was going against the Labour caucus, um, which uh, was on June 25. And then in the media a few days later, she said she would cross the floor again if the motion was reintroduced. Now, keep in mind that recognising the state of Palestine is part of Labour's official policy platform that was adopted at its 2023 national conference. Um, But uh, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese suspended payment from the caucus on June 30 uh, over these, over her vote and subsequent comments. And she said she was uh, intimidated into resigning. Um, so just to kind of give some context, uh, Payman has uh, been speaking out against Labor's policy on uh, the Israel's genocide since May, um, including speaking at a rally in uh, Borloo, Perth. And uh, she said that Labor, instead of advocating for justice, is performatively gesturing at defending the oppressor's right to oppress while gaslighting the global community about the rights of self-defense. Um, so it's been, you know, a bit of a flashpoint for people who, you know, the Palestine movement has been going for more than nine months now and Labour hasn't really done anything except for token gestures, um, saying they support like a conditional ceasefire and things like that. They haven't taken any of the meaningful action to stop supplying weapons to Israel or or stop supporting Israel politically or economically. And I mean, the other one is the Pine Gap base is still, uh, the the US-Australia base is still uh, sending uh, surveillance data to Israel that they're using to, you know, target their their bombs and stuff like that. And despite uh, Australia's government and Pentagon's insistence that we're not sending weapons to Israel, which is, you know, technically true, we are still sending weapon parts to Israel. Yeah, we're part of that international kind of global supply chain that is creating the weapons for Israel. Even if we're not producing a whole F-35 fighter jet ourselves, we're giving crucial parts that they wouldn't be able to fly or drop bombs without. Um, So you can understand why, you know, a lot of people who are previously Labour supporters or even Labour members are very frustrated um, and, you know, getting very angry and, and upset with how Labor's acting. Um, uh, so payment has kind of bec- become a representative of this and has, has obviously now stepped down. Um, just a little story from uh, Gadigal, Sydney perspective. We had a rally here uh, on the 10th of July, um, kind of in, a- outside the New South Wales Labor Party headquarters, uh, pretty much uh, supporting uh, Fatima Payment. It was organized by some Palestinian activists and unionists and some students. And there was also uh, another, like a Labour member who had also resigned over Palestine and over how the uh, payment has been treated. So it's definitely become this kind of flashpoint. And I resigned from the OP last week. I've been there for many years. I was a cost bearer. Woo! Uh, to the presentation of having payment and discussing treatment in space from the public and caucus and its leadership. But it's also, I mean, I think one of the crazy things is the the media and political commentators kind of reaction. 
Uh, oh yeah, they've absolutely just gone rapid. There's there's been this kind of extreme uh, response. Definitely, like uh, all a lot of it is very tinged with uh, racist um, ideas and perspectives, including you know the ra- the way that Albanese and and Peter Dutton have responded. One example of this was uh, Patricia Carvelis, who's a, a political commentator, taking issue with Payman saying "inshallah," um, which is just a very kind of normal phrase, mean, meaning if God wills, is very commonly used. And she's kind of making this huge deal of like, um, you know, she's f- uh, being following kind of religious uh, motivation for for her actions when it's it's really it's an, it's basis in human rights and standing up against the kind of racism and Islamophobia in our society and against obviously against the genocide. And it's not just been the media as well. Um, the WA Premier, uh, Roger Crook, when she when she arrived back in Perth to uh, an amazing reception, actually, she uh, there was a whole bunch of people lined up at the airport waiting to meet her and um, applaud her. But uh, Roger Cook referred to her as, uh, I'm, this is off the top of my head, a, a cane-toed cancer from the east, you know, likening her to a, a imported plague, and that's like just the sheer so horrible vitriol in that. Yeah, it's really you know if if people didn't think. Australia was a racist country then look at the media surrounding this and and you'll be you'll be proven wrong um particularly I guess it's some of the context is like Payman was a refugee from Afghanistan came here in I think it was 2004 or uh, mid-2000s um so comments like that is just you know it's it's part of this whole anti-immigrant anti anyone who isn't you know white uh part of our society and yeah, as you just mentioned, the support support from the community has been really good to see. Like the the, the people should check out the video uh, and photos from her arriving at the uh, airport in Bali, Perth, um, just to see the strong support amongst the community. There's also been some support from uh, some labor branches, including one in Albanese's own electorate, and as well as many kind of young labor branches. Um, yeah, so it's worth noting that the, the union movement has come out in really strong support of uh, Fatima Payman. The CFMEU National Secretary, Zach Smith, said that, uh, quote, Senator Payman's principled stand, stand on Palestine this week undoubtedly strengthened the labor movement. And any suggestion that we are weaker because someone stood up for peace, justice, and equality makes no sense. So you can see there's a really sharp divide between the kind of media and political class commentary on on all this and the majority of ordinary kind of working people, um, which is, you know, it's the same divide that we've seen on on the Palestine uh, issue this whole uh, nine months. Um, Just one other element is uh, this... uh, there's been this kind of racist kind of fear mongering about uh, this new kind of group, which is a Muslim votes group, which is pretty much um, a, a kind of a, a group that's targeting, uh, supporting campaigns uh, against uh, politicians who support the genocide in kind of key areas. So including in kind of like Western Sydney um, and other parts of the country where, you know, there's a uh, strong support for Palestine, but there's not, um, the, their representatives are, are not taking any uh, action. And there's been all this fear mongering about, you know, a religious based political party and, oh, we can't have religion in politics. And obviously we don't want, you know, um, uh, we want a separation of church and state and things like that. But it's like every time parliament opens is with the Lord's prayer. It's like, there's not like, there's this like strict, uh, thing happening anyway. And, uh, there's no real indication that the Muslim Votes Group is a political party or, at all. It's just a, a group that's supporting certain uh, campaigns and certain candidates. In fact, um, Payman, I think yesterday or the day before, actually did specifically say to anyone uh, thinking that they should form a Muslim-only party, that essentially that it would be a bad idea and not to do it. Um, so it's clearly that there's an awareness that 
um, you know, there's a feeling that Muslim and Arab community voices aren't being represented well enough, mm. but there's an awareness that that should be, you shouldn't form a single party, uh, single issue party over that. Yeah, and I think, you know, this we'll touch on this topic a little bit later in the podcast uh, in the elections in, in Britain and France, but I think we will see, you know, a strong uh, response to, you know, the failures of uh, Labour uh, to do anything meaningful about Palestine, about the genocide. So I think, you know, Labour's kind of, that's what that's, that's what's really freaking them out is, you know, we're going to lose all these... Uh, votes to independent candidates and, you know, Greens and uh, socialists and things like that. So uh, I think that's another dynamic. Um, I think it's this topic as as well as the past nine months has made it pretty clear that Labour doesn't represent the community and doesn't even represent Labour Party members, um, but pretty much represents a section of Australian capitalism and big business and uh, parts of the union bureaucracy. So like the Labour politicians and MPs are not really beholden to what the community wants. They're not beholden to their local branch of Labour Party. They're only really beholden to uh, the kind of caucus and the kind of ba- uh, shadowy figures behind the scenes who make the important decisions. Um, so it's obvious, it makes, makes it pretty clear it's not a very uh, democratic system or uh, party that that they're part of. Um, so it'll be interesting to see kind of where this develops. Uh, Lydia Thorpe, who obviously resigned from the Greens over their uh, position on The Voice uh, last year, has welcomed uh, Payman's actions and, and said it's it's great to see uh, more kind of independent voices in Parliament. Um, and Payman's going to remain as a senator for the next four years. His senators are elected for uh, kind of double the time as a as an MP. Um, well, hopefully more than just the next four years. Well, yes, yes. So we'll see uh, kind of what she can, what she does in that period. Um, I just point people, if you're in uh, Gadigal or Sydney or in the surrounding kind of area, there's going to be a big protest at the uh, Australian uh, Labor Party New South Wales Labor Conference on July 27 at Sydney Town Hall. Uh, and Albanese and Chris Minns and all, all those... Uh, all that rogues gallery are all going to be there. So there's going to be big protests on Palestine and also other protests on housing, uh, environment and things like that. So definitely come down for that. People should also check out the latest cover of Green Left, which has a you know big picture of uh, Fatima Payment and it, it says it pretty simply. Um, Fatima Payment is right. This is a genocide. And I think no matter what you think of, um, you know, strategies or tactics, I think it's pretty clear that Payman represents um, the kind of anger and outrage over Labour's inaction on the genocide in Gaza. And I think it's good that more and more people are speaking out. Um, So we'll obviously follow this story on the podcast over the coming months. Um, And yeah, keep you updated. So the University of Sydney has introduced some draconian new rules, which is called the Campus Access Policy, which aim to clamp down on political activity on campus. Now, the the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties have already stated that they oppose this policy in the strongest terms, with President Lydia Shelley calling for its immediate reversal and saying that uh, these rules are an affront to the democratic principles that universities should be fostering. We are lucky to be joined today by Michaela Panagiris, who is a performance artist, an academic, and a member of the National Tertiary Education Union branch at Sydney Uni. And we're going to discuss these new rules and what impact they're going to have. So welcome to the podcast, Michaela. Thanks, Isaac. Um, So, Michaela, what is the campus access policy and what restrictions does it introduce? So the campus access policy, policy is it's a bit of a 
euphemistic name. It's actually a restriction on access policy. Um, it's a policy that was adopted without any consultation with staff or students or with any representatives from the National Tertiary Education Union. And it basically curtails the freedom of speech and right to protest. So it does not explicitly ban all demonstrations, um, but its effect will be to severely limit and silence protests and dissent. And this is for a number of reasons. We have to, as staff or students, we have to give management 72 hours notice for any demonstration. Um, it also forces us to seek approval, which of course can be denied. So any of the typical things that you use in a demonstration, like megaphones, other kinds of amplification. We also need to seek approval um, 72 hours in advance for really simple things like putting up a poster, flying a banner, or setting up a stall. Other parts of the policy state that any indoor demonstrations, so any occupations or things like going into uh, an office of management to demand something, all that kind of indoor activity is completely banned. The other disturbing thing about this policy is that um, it empowers the University Protective Services staff, which are like the security on campus, to detain alleged offenders before handing them over to the New South Wales police. So it's like pretty intense uh, rules, like 72 hours just to put up a poster. I mean, like that doesn't just affect uh, political activities. There's a whole bunch of people that are going to be affected by these. Um, I guess it kind of seems to come in the context of the Palestine Solidarity Encampment at the University of Sydney, which closed down a few weeks ago after 55 days, I think it was. Which I think it was one of the longest running uh, solidarity encampments uh, in the whole world, which is, is very impressive and hands off to all the activists involved. But what do you think uh, is the relationship between these this new policy and the encampment and do you think the new rules are kind of attempting to prevent kind of similar protests in the future? Yeah, I definitely think it's a obvious um, cynical response. It's, it's an attempt to um, clamp down on any future activism. So you're right to point out that, you know, the historic nature of the students' Palestine encampment was part of a global movement. And because this policy, you know, explicitly prohibits clamping, camping on university grounds and on, and prohibits occupations, it's explicitly saying none of this kind of camping, encampment, Palestine protests is acceptable. In fact, if you see a recent article in The Australian, uh, Mark Scott, the university's vice chancellor, actually explicitly states that the purpose of the policy was to prevent future encampments so you know it's not just about the camping though you know there has been a groundswell of support for palestine from students and staff and it is targeted not just in outrage at the genocide on in an abstract way but specifically to our management to get them to divest from israel and to cut ties with military and arms um, manufacturers so this is actually a significant um, demand that we're putting on the university and they're trying to squash this demand. And one of the ways that they can do that is by trying to squash our ability to protest on campus. So yeah, it's definitely related to the student encampment. The timing is, it makes it really obvious. Um, it's, it's also really obvious because the students have said repeatedly when they were forced to shut down the encampment that they were going to continue to escalate pressure on management after the encampment in the next semester. So the fact that the university management's gone and done this clamp down on protests is a clear sign that management does not want that continuing continuing pressure on management. Um, something that Isaac uh, pointed out earlier is um, this doesn't just affect um, the ability of students to protest. This affects uh, unions, this affects club activities, and you can't you have to ask for, for permission and 72 hours just to put up a notice for a club activity or um, an NTEU poster. 
And so that, and that effectively gives the university the right to decide whether or not you even advertise for your union. So I was wondering um, how the unionists and student activists responded to these rules. Yeah, so our first response is that we're not going to comply with this at all. So, in fact, um, myself and other unionists from the GUSID branch committee, we did a poster run um, a couple of days ago defiance of this. As for the student groups, um, there's a petition that they've put, put out uh, calling for this policy to be rescinded. There's also um, a number of plans that the students have for action. So you mentioned the um, stalls by student clubs. There's going to be a student-led stall day on the 31st of July, um, which is going to be in defiance of the policy. Um, the NTU branch committee, we've also called a rally um, in response to this policy demanding that it be rescinded, and that rally is going to be in the first week of semester. And there's also going to be a number of um, public meetings and forums to debate this campus access policy and also, you know, talk about the general suppression of NTU members and other staff and students for their Palestinian solidarity. Uh, the other thing that um, unionists are, are going to do is seek some legal clarification on the campus access policy. Awesome. So there's, it's good to see there's so much resistance to these draconian rules from um, staff and students. Um, I guess the best way for people to, to support the campaign would be obviously things like signing the petition and showing up to the you know, rallies and forums and events that you've uh, just listed. Is there any other ways that people can, you know, support the campaign or, or uh, you know, oppose these new rules at, at UCID? Well, it's been really great to see the amount of community support um, for staff and students. People in the community are, are outraged, and rightly so. So, you know, I would say to everyone, you know, continue that outrage, whether it be via social media, um, via attending the rallies that we're calling, signing the petition. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, you can uh, also, you know, write letters, okay, to management, especially if you're an alumni or an ex-staff um, member. So there's many things that you can do. Awesome. So hopefully people... Uh who are listening to this uh, get involved in opposing this these rules. Just while we're on the topic of, I guess, universities clamping down on uh, activism or protests, um, I just wanted to mention that at the University of Melbourne, uh, there's also been uh, students who are being targeted by uh, the university management with politically motivated uh, misconduct uh, charges and accusations, particularly in relation to... Uh, well, you, you mentioned the, these new rules uh, ban kind of occupying buildings, and that was one of the inspiring parts of the campaign at the University of Melbourne was the occupation of the Arts West building, which uh, students renamed Mahmoud's Hall um, uh, in honour of a, a student in Palestine who, had, who was intending to come and study at the University of Melbourne before he was um, killed in an Israeli airstrike. Um, so 21 students are being charged at the University of Melbourne, which is including a Palestinian student and an anti-Zionist uh, Jewish student, um, and they're threatening to expel them and, and things like this uh, as, a, as a way of intimidating um, and attempting to stifle dissent and protest. Uh, but the interesting thing that's come out now is um, the students found out that they were being surveilled and tracked by the university. Um, their, their, their internet uh, usage, um, literally security cameras around uh, the campus, um, which obviously violates, you know, the privacy and um, violating basic rights of free speech and protest um, protest rights. So now, th the university is actually under investigation by uh, it's called the Office of the Victorian Information Commissioner 
over the surveillance. Um, so it's good to see like that's being taken quite seriously and there's some pushback to how the university has tried to crack down on, uh, on student uh, activism. Um, and an interesting kind of parallel between uh, the University of Melbourne and Sydney is that both uh, won kind of disclosure agreements um, and both are kind of uh, student activists and staff have said, you know, we're going to keep fighting for full divestment um, in the future. So the, the universities are obviously trying to prevent that from happening. Uh, and there was actually a protest uh, yesterday on July 10th uh, at the University of Melbourne calling on the university to drop the charges and um, also standing up for students' right to protest and the right to not be surveilled. Um, so it's obviously this thing that's happening. I'm sure there's more examples. I mean, we already reported on a previous podcast about the ANU student who was expelled for talking about that Palestinians have the right to resist on radio. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this campaign develops. Uh, but yeah, thanks for joining us, Markella. Did you have any final comments before uh, we move on to the next topic? Yeah, I just wanted to, to say that, you know, it's it's outrageous, this authoritarian action on behalf of Sydney University Management and the Vice-Chancellor, you know, and it's not just um, going to have an effect on Palestinian activism, but on all the other kinds of activism that happen on campus. So, for example, we have a strong tradition of LGBTIQA plus activism on campus, First Nations activism. In fact, at Sydney Uni, it's where the start point was for Charles Perkins and his famous Freedom Rides. We have a tradition of the anti-Vietnam War protests and also historic fights to save university faculties like the Sydney College of the Arts, which was actually an occupation struggle. So there's a whole lot of history and a lot of um, really important times where students and staff have said no to things at a global level and at a local level, uh, which this policy is seeking to stifle. Yeah, so let's keep up the efforts to oppose this policy. And um, I guess we'll hopefully have, be able to have you back on when uh, we hopefully get a good news story and overthrow these rules at, uh, at some point. But yeah, we'll keep, we'll keep people updated on the podcast. I believe these draconian measures just backfire and bring more, bring more people into, into struggle collectively. Yeah, 100%. All right, thanks, Markella. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks, Isaac. So we've had two uh, big elections uh, in Europe over the past couple of weeks in France and in Britain, and they've both kind of delivered uh, very interesting results that shift the status quo of politics in the resp respective countries. So we're not going to be able to give, you know, a full breakdown of everything, but we'll try to give a, a summary of each. And we'll start off with the election in Britain, which um, interestingly was the lowest election turnout ever. Um, but some really good news is that the Tories have been outed from office for the first time in 14 years, which, you know, is worth celebrating. Um, and it's the biggest Ooh. conservative defeat uh, in their history of, of their party. So that's a, a really great news. And um, that has led to the election of uh, Labour Prime Minister Keir Starmer, uh, who easily coasted into a majority in a, with a landslide victory. Um, but the really kind of telling part of all this is that uh, Labour got very few votes. They, they won 64% of the seats, which is 412 seats, but only got 34% of the vote. Uh, and then the Conservatives got 121 seats and the Liberal Democrats got 72 seats. So some commentators have called this a loveless landslide um, with Labour really only winning because the Conservative vote fell apart as opposed to anyone being that excited about Labour. Um, and that makes sense when you, when you understand what uh, Keir Starmer represents, which is really just kind of a rehashing of the the kind of politics of Tony Blair and his ilk, mm. that uh, third way labour, um, flavour of neoliberalism. So it's not, um, it's not that exciting necessarily. It's not a huge victory for the left so much as it is a defeat for the right, but that's still worth celebrating. 100%. And I think, you know, it's pretty illuminating when you see like uh, Jeremy Corbyn in 2017 actually won more votes than 
uh, Starmer did in this election. So uh, on a much much more uh, uh, kind of expansive kind of left wing um, uh, platform. Uh, the Labour vote only really increased because the SNP, the Scottish uh, Nationalist Party, um, kind of imploded and fell apart. So uh, one just side note is that Britain has a um, first past the post electoral system. So there's not there's no preferencing. Um, so it really obviously encourages people to vote for, you know, one of the, the major parties. Um, and but what uh, I guess the the other the, the kind of dark side or the, a, a negative perspective of this election is that a lot of the votes that went away from the Conservative Party and why they fell apart so completely is because a lot of the votes went to the far right uh, Reform UK Party, which is led by Nigel Farage, whose people will know as a, a far right um, uh, kind of figurehead in in the UK and was one of the leading kind of pushes behind Brexit and, and is pretty much pushing anti-immigration kind of rhetoric and things like that. Um, so that's not good news that they've done quite well. Um, and, you know, I think the the kind of right-wingers are talking about, you know, we need to uh, bring back, you know, reunite this uh, far right and the con more conservatives together. And then they would probably ha have actually done quite well, um, which is a bit scary. Um, just on what Labour kind of went into the election uh, offering, it was basically like not much. They abandoned one of their major policies, which was about green energy investment. And so they barely have really any other major policies. Um, they're not really willing to raise taxes on the rich. Um, they're not really offering any big spending on uh, things that are really important to people, like cost of living issues and stuff like that. There's a few like small programs here and there. Um, so another term that I read that I really enjoyed was the majority without a mandate because <laughs> they, they, they won a majority of the votes, but they don't really have a mandate to do anything because they didn't really campaign on anything. Um, no, I mean, they, they kind of knew what they were doing when they just, you know, their whole tactic was just, we will beat the Tories. That's, mm -hmm. and now the Tories are beaten. Now watch. <laughs> it's a bit, <laughs> you know, it doesn't really provide much for what they do in government. Yeah, it's it's kind of like what we've seen here in Australia with the like kind of like small target strategy of like, well, no one can attack us if we don't actually promise to do anything or promote any policies. We're just not as bad as them. That's our only kind of platform. Um, so it's it's kind of depressing. Uh, I think looking into if you look into it a bit uh, deeper, their kind of actual big plan is to give more control of the economy to big business so that you know private uh companies can build infrastructure and things like that which is obviously uh not going to be good for ordinary people um more privatization um and it's a bit telling that the, the murdoch media and big business is kind of backed back to the labor party in the election uh as it was became clear that the conservatives weren't going to win so that's all kind of depressing, but there is some good news coming out of out of this as well. Um, yep, Corbyn got his seat. Yes, that's that's the the big one. Um, so Jeremy Corbyn, people will know, got kicked out of Labour um, for uh, being too left and too radical and um, supporting Palestine. Um, and he he was um, he was branded with the anti-Semite smear with, for supporting Palestine before it was called. Yes, one hundred percent. So. Uh, he's kind of been kind of pushed to the wayside for the last couple of years, but now kind of finally left the, been kicked out of labor properly and, uh, decided to run as an independent in his, um, the seat that he's, he's been in for this, uh, since he was first elected, uh, which is Islington North. And so he kind of easily retained his seat. There wasn't, there was some kind of fear that he wouldn't win it against the Labour candidate, but he kind of... Yeah, the um, the polling showed that it was almost impossible for him. So, you know, once again, polling just, uh, as, as we'll see later for the French elections, um, the polling for these, for these kinds of, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, the polling around these uh, politically polarised uh, figures tends to be pretty unreliable. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Well, just before we continue with the rest of the news around this, I just wanted to play a short clip from uh, Corbyn's uh, election speech um, uh, when he was first uh, found out that he had been elected. Ours is a positive campaign trying to bring hope to people who are in housing stress, who are homeless, who are going through mental health difficulties, who are worried about their future. And the political system has to produce answers to those concerns and those worries. Demonizing refugees, demonizing people from other countries won't solve those problems. The only way we solve the problems of our community is by uniting our communities. And our campaign was utterly determined to bring that degree of unity to it. And so this result is, to me, a resounding message from the people of Islington North that they want something different, they want something better, and in the new government that's coming in, they're looking for an end to things like the two-child benefit policy cap. They're looking, looking for regulation of the private rented sector. And if I may say so, they're also looking for a government that on the world stage will search for peace, not war, and not allow the terrible conditions to go on that are happening in Gaza at the present time. So yeah, that's uh, Corbyn. Oh. So yeah, that's Corbyn. Uh, uh, speech when he found out he's elected and you can see you know he's uh why people are drawn to those kind of policies um actually taking the real issues of our time very seriously and coming up with some solutions um so it'll be good to see you know over the next couple of years how corbyn can be a bit of a thorn in the side for keir starmer and labor and hopefully force them to be a little bit more progressive than they would have otherwise been um just some other kind of notes is that the Greens uh, did well, uh, who are kind of a similar similar to the Greens in Australia, and they won uh, four seats. And then there was four other independents other than Corbyn who who are kind of pro-Palestine independents who also won their seats. So that's um, nine um, kind of left left kind of wing uh, uh, seats that were won. So that's a good sign. And it was three million people roughly voted to the left of Labour in the election. So uh, there's a definitely an opportunity coming out of this to, to build up the kind of left movements and resist Starmer's Labour's kind of neoliberal politics and build an alternative. Um, we already kind of, we already know that Labour's not going to be able to resolve any of the pressing issues in uh, that people are facing in, in Britain. Um, and obviously we know they, they're not going to take any action on stopping the genocide unless, uh, the movements have forced them to, um, but you know, the, the, the kind of, uh, movements in the, in Britain have already said that they're going to continue to resist, um, the incoming government and ensure that, you know, people who are worried about cost of living, worried about, you know, the constant war, um, uh, able to, you know, uh, move to the left um, and and aren't kind of picked on by the the right and the far right uh, in Britain. So that's uh, the British election. Did you have any other comments on on Britain? Uh, no, you just about covered it. Awesome. So we'll move on to the other big election of the past few weeks, which was in France, uh, which is a bit more. Uh, I'd say a bit more interesting, a bit more exciting. Um, we're going into the elections. We there was a lot of predictions that the far right uh, National Rally Party, which is led by Marine Le Pen and Jordan Bardella, um, were likely to win. They won the first round of the elections, and everyone was feeling pretty gloomy that they they were likely to go on to win the second round and form government. So it was a uh, very exciting and a big upset when the left alliance, which is the new popular front, which includes uh, the radical left France Insoumise, uh, the Socialist Party, Communist Party, and the Greens, uh, stormed ahead and won the most seats in the election, um, and people were were you know incredibly excited uh, watching the results come in. I'll just play a short clip from people seeing the results. Et 
So that was just one crowd uh, on the streets uh, of Paris watching the results. Um, and you should definitely check out the video because it's it's, uh, it's really good. Uh, you can see the kind of joy and uh, emotion on people's faces as they find out that, you know, the far they've defeated the far right this time. Uh, we don't always get, get good news um, uh, on the left and on this podcast, but that, this is a good news story. But it, it is uh, really notable, though, how they... Um they actually won that because it wasn't just a, a fact of uh, the polling not being correct or anything like that. It was quite a deliberate banding together of all these uh, centre-left to far-left parties, recognising that there was this looming threat of fascism, essentially, and realising that if they, they almost like kind of a, a mirrored parallel to what happened in England um, or in Britain, um, they realized that if they split the vote between themselves, the, the far right would just dominate everywhere. But if they actually strategically didn't run against each other in all these different seats, then they could actually, um, then they, they could actually have a broad victory to the left. And um, combined with that, have you know, the, I think probably what is apparently one of the most uh, dynamic and um, biggest election campaigns that France has seen in a long time with uh, tens of thousands of new activists, large sections of uh, civil society, huge widespread door-to-door -door work, hundreds of rallies, marches, uh, events, initiatives, appeals to vote for radical change. Um, so, you know, this, this didn't just kind of happen out of nowhere or in a vacuum. It happened because of very conscious, deliberate, and an amazing amount of work that went into it. Yeah, massive effort by uh, the left in France to, to achieve this. And I think... Uh, there was celebrations on the streets kind of that night uh, that went all the way into the, the next morning. Um, and I think it's probably, it's fair enough after such a, a, a intense kind of campaign. And then uh, there's, you know, reports of huge sense of relief and um, there was kind of rallies around the country on July 7 to celebrate. Uh, the other thing, if, if you watch that, uh, that video that we just played a short clip of, there's another video of... Um, to some far right uh, uh, national rally kind of supporters watching the results come in, and they're expecting to have this elated victory, and they're just like, "Oh my god, what what has happened?" And it looks so like dejected and depressed. So that's <laughs> it's a good comparison. Um, uh, the other, I think, the other good thing is that uh, the the with the the campaign that the uh, National Popular Front. Um, the new popular front sorry uh did was it kind of gave uh a big uh portion of the population were able to hear the arguments about you know that things are, that good things are possible that it is possible to you know tax the rich and rebuild our uh like things like hospitals and schools and other infrastructure and kind of fight against uh, racism and sexism and uh, so that that's a really uh, good aspect as well. Just to give the kind of the numbers, the New Popular Front got 182 seats, uh, National Rally got 143, and Macron, uh, Emmanuel Macron, who's the president, his uh, party got 168. So to get a majority uh, and rule as uh, as majority government is 289 seats. So still quite a long way off for New Popular Front. So that kind of leads us to the second uh, element of this story, which is that like, it's a very uncertain time now uh, where no real grouping can form government on their own. Uh, so there's a bit of a political stalemate and a lot of uncertainty about what will happen. Um, there's obviously with the, uh, the left has succeeded in stopping the fascists from taking power, but the left Alliance, you know, is fragile. There's a lot of different, uh, debates and, uh, and discussions going on um but you know the right are, are very downtrodden but they're still got more representatives so yeah that there's so, a, uh, yeah um yeah and uh so the the marxist and green left contributor john mullen who uh wrote writes for green left about french issues is outlined three ways forward one is a left minority government where they can kind of pull together just enough um support to to actually, uh, you know, make make a government and make policy. Uh, the second way forward would be for a right-left coalition, 
uh, which would exclude... Um, yeah, excluding France Insoumise and National Rally, which is like, you know, the, the most left party and the fascists. Yep. Uh, uh, and the, the third way forward would be a, a so-called government of appointed experts. So, um, yeah, a government of appointed experts, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the, you know, there'll be some who are trying to argue this is like a rational idea, but you know, there's no way that will be a, accountable or, uh, you know, govern for the working class. It obviously just govern for the elites. So what, um, Mullen kind of outlines as well in that article is that, you know, the left obviously wanted to go for the minority government um, option, uh, which, you know, it could be difficult to pass laws, but there's a lot of uh, changes that you can make without having to, you know, actually pass laws. Um, and I guess the other thing is there'd be a lot of, I guess, anti-government rhetoric coming from the media if the, if the left were in power. And, and I guess to, to, to have that be successful would require the movements to continue and to, to strengthen. Um, what would be really bad is the, the right-left coalition, which would be kind of like the centrist, uh, the, the more kind of centrist groups from the left coalition and the Macron government, uh, who are previous government coming, kind of coming together. Um, but that would be, you know, abandoning all the radical proposals that people actually voted for in this election. Uh, and bringing a lot of disappointment um, and misery, and likely, and yeah, people would be very disillusioned with, you know, I think because these this campaign has brought a lot of people into left ideas. If uh, if this government isn't able to, or if this coalition isn't able to deliver on at least some of that, or if they abandon those ideals, then people are just going to uh, quite possibly just give up and say, you know, well, we would just lie to about it, basically. Mm. And it would definitely leave kind of an opening for the far right to uh, come back in the next election and say, see, look, you voted for, you know, you voted for the left and nothing worked out how you wanted it. So like, we're the only ones who can actually offer a solution. So that would be a pretty bad uh, result. Um, so at this point, we don't really know exactly what's going to happen. I mean, the latest I heard was that uh, Macron, who is uh, still president, um, has refused to uh, put uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who's the leader of the FI, um, as prime minister, even though they got the most votes. Um, and so there's a bit of a stalemate at this point. So um, we'll get, we'll guess we'll see how this develops and people should follow um, Green Left for the latest updates. Um, our contributor, John Mullen, is, will continue to uh, give us the, the latest info from, from France. Um, yeah, and as he as he points out, um, you know, even though this is worth celebrating and it is a victory for the left, uh, he's, he's quite specifically points out that this is the beginning of an evolving crisis in France, not its resolution. So this isn't the, uh, you know, this isn't the end point where we can say, yep, this is it with one. This is the start of, you know, three years of, you know, the next three years of uh, political crisis that the left is going to have to fight to for now. 100%. And I think looking at both of these elections together, you can see they're obviously very different uh, contexts and different positions, but both will require like the left to uh, continue organizing and strengthening to resist this kind of far right slide that we've been hearing about coming across Europe with uh, a lot of European countries with uh, far right governments now and including in the EU uh, parliament. Um, so that will have to be continue to be resisted. But I also think it gives an interesting indication for what the uh, next federal election in Australia will look like. As I mean, as activists, uh, socialist activists in Australia, we're trying to think about how things will play out here. Um, and it'll be, it's interesting seeing these two, uh, the, like liberal democracies, uh, you know, uh, interesting comparisons with, with what might, we might see in Australia. So let's hope... Let's be positive and hope that uh, the left can encourage more and more people into action to build real resistance to capitalism and neoliberalism and hope for uh, we can build a better future in, in these countries and also uh, in the world uh, in general. So that comes to the end of our uh, podcast for this week. Um, just got a few final things to plug. Um, if people want to check out the Eco Socialism 2024 sessions, all the videos have now been uploaded onto 
the Green Left website and the Green Left YouTube channel and also the Eco Socialism website. So you can click the link in the description to watch any of those sessions. And they're also uh, starting to be uploaded on the podcast feed. So there should already be a few sessions in there. Um, and, you know, there's so much worthwhile content to check out. And make sure you get to your uh, weekly, fortnightly, monthly Palestine rallies and any other actions that are happening in your city. Uh, and we need to keep building the pressure to end the genocide in Gaza. Uh, just a shout out to uh, Sean Valenzuela or at Little Archer Beats for providing the, the music for this podcast. Check out his uh, other music and his other work uh, on his Instagram or uh, Bandcamp pages. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can become a supporter of Green Left to help us continue doing this kind of work. Uh, it's only $5 a month and it makes a massive difference to help us continue. You know, independent media uh, always struggles and we don't take any corporate uh, donations uh, or advertising. So we're entirely, you know, run by people power and, and your support is like, makes a huge difference. So just head to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to become a supporter or make a donation uh what also helps is to you know give this podcast five star review on whatever uh platform you're listening on and um you know leave a comment or uh, a like or whatever it is on on your platform and that helps more people you know, see this podcast and share it around yeah share it around with your friends as well that makes a massive difference um but yeah uh, i've been isaac nellist uh thanks for listening and I've been and continue to be Riley Green. Thanks for listening. <laughs> uh, we'll see you next week for more uh, news and discussion. Thank you. Bye.